Hello, and welcome to Addressing Voice, Swallowing, and Speech Changes in Parkinson's. This program is brought to you by the Parkinson's Foundation in collaboration with the Spalding Outpatient Center at Kent Hospital. I'm Melody McLaughlin, the Senior Community Program Manager for the New England chapter of the Parkinson's Foundation, and I'm so thrilled to be joining you today for this very special program. For those of you who are newer to the Parkinson's Foundation, welcome. We are the nation's leading community for people with Parkinson's, the people who love them, and all of those who are working to end the disease. We warmly welcome those within our New England chapter region, but also the many of you joining from across the country, as well as abroad, including our friends in Switzerland today, India, the UK, as well as Canada. It's with our presence in communities across the country and the globe, we believe in a promise of a cure and a better life today for those impacted by PD. The urgency of our mission really translates into what we do. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals. One, ensuring better care for everyone for today. Two, understanding Parkinson's through research for tomorrow. And three, educating and empowering the Parkinson's community for us all. We provide free resources, including our parkinson.org website, educational book series, webinars like today, podcasts, our hospital safety kit called Aware and Care, our newly diagnosed kit, and of course our toll-free helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO, which is staffed by Parkinson's specialists. And on the research front, we invest more than $10 million annually to study Parkinson's, not only what causes it, how to treat it, but ultimately how to cure it. I'd like to highlight PD Generation. It's a national initiative that offers genetic testing and genetic counseling at no cost for people with Parkinson's disease. We are really thrilled to announce that PD Gene has launched its next step, a genetic test that can be completed at home. To learn more, feel free to visit parkinson.org slash PD Generation. So how are we connecting with our communities? You're being here with us today, even though virtually is a prime example of that. It's really through our centers of excellence, local PD experts like our speaker today, volunteers, advocates, and staff across the country that we bring people together to educate and empower those impacted by Parkinson's disease. We also connect with our Parkinson's communities through our nationwide moving day events. Since 2011, our moving day walks have raised more than $30.8 million to support research, our centers of excellence network, and provide educational resources and programs across the country. Here in New England, we are very excited to share that we are bringing Moving Day to New Hampshire on May 16th, 2021. To learn more, please visit movingdaynewhampshire.org. And always looking for ways to keep you connected, the Parkinson's Foundation has been providing weekly educational and wellness programs in a virtual format through our PD Health at Home series. Uh, PD Health at Home is presented by the Light of Day Foundation, whose generosity has made this programming possible so that you can join us for Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, or Fitness Fridays by visiting parkinson.org slash pdhealth. Today's program was made uh, possible by the support of our sponsors. Today, we thank Kior Kern and Medtronic. We invite you to learn more about our wonderful program sponsors by visiting our chapter supporters webpage at parkinson.org slash New England slash chapter dash supporters. And with that, I am now delighted to introduce today's speaker, Gina Goyette. Gina graduated from the University of Rhode Island with a BS in Communicative Disorders and a minor in Human Development and Family Services. She went on to complete her degree as a Master of Science in Speech Language Pathology at URI and earned her Certification of Clinical Competence. She began her career in early intervention, school-based SLP services, and a pediatric outpatient practice. She soon realized her passion for working with adults with a special interest in voice and swallowing disorders. She became an SLVT Loud, E-Loud, and Loud for Life certified clinician and obtained an ACE award for commitment and excellence in lifelong learning. She currently works out of Spalding Outpatient Center at Kent Hospital, East Greenwich, which is, and she's also the site manager in SLP. Please join me in welcoming our fantastic speaker today, Gina. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be here today um, and to have the opportunity, um, and thank you, Melody, for that marvelous um, introduction. 
So like Melody had um, said, I've worked in a variety of different settings across the continuum of care, but I found that I am truly passionate about working with adults and especially adults um, living with Parkinson's and their care team. So today um, is an absolute honor of mine to speak with you today. And today's discussion is based off of my clinical knowledge, my understanding, my practice, and my work with individuals with Parkinson's. So if at any time, again, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to enter them in the chat um, and we will talk about them after and let's get started. So Melody had gone over our, our program overview. So our objectives today are really to truly gain a better understanding of how voice swallowing and other speech subsystems are impacted by Parkinson's and also to go over some strategies today to help manage those challenges and some therapies or treatment options that you and your care team can think about. So again, this is a really cheesy picture of me um, and kind of a, a brief history of me. For disclosures, um, I am a full-time employee at Spalding Outpatient Rehabilitation at Kent Hospital in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. I have received no compensation from this presentation and I have no additional financial disclosures or relationships to um, disclose at this time. So what is speech language pathology? That is a question that I get uh, pretty frequently, I would say definitely weekly. Um, as part of the whole rehabilitation team, PT, OT speech, um, the actual ins and outs of speech therapy um, aren't as widely known as um, our colleagues in the PT and OT world. So SLPs work with individuals from infancy to adulthood. And how we go about that is we help to prevent, assess, diagnose, and treat a variety of speech, language, social communication, cognitive communication, and swallowing disorders. So it's very general, very broad. So today we'll be really honing in a little more on just a few of those things, but I could talk all day um, about all of them. So my role as an SLP, especially working with individuals with Parkinson's, is to target those more invisible or subtle symptoms of Parkinson's. So how we do that is we help maintain function and support the maintenance of function as much as possible. We also help to make sure we're helping to maintain independence as well, right? and restore function. Is there an, another way we can target these? Supporting optimal safety in all your environments, um, whether that be at home, at work, um, in the community, helping to support your safety that way. And then also providing practical strategies for everyday use. We wanna make sure as an SLP, we're working on things that you're gonna use in your every single day. We also help provide education my goal as an SLP is to transfer as much of my knowledge to you, to your care team, care partner um, as possible so you can have those tools within your toolkit. And also to provide any additional resources to help you support and achieve your goals because that's ultimately what's most important. So what are some of those in, invisible or more gradual symptoms of Parkinson's related to um, speech and language therapy and, and how do we address them? So I like to think of those speech related uh, symptoms as more of an iceberg, right? So with Parkinson's, it, it's more widely understood or, or widely known that the physical symptoms, right? So generally and very broadly thinking of Parkinson's, um, someone in the community may think, oh, well, they, they think of tremors, right? Or slow gait or the, the bradykinesias or dyskinesias or, or too much movement due to medications or stiffness, freezes, imbalance difficulties. So those are more commonly known symptoms and I truly believe that is due to the ability to be observed. Um, so 
the, us, the community, we have a better understanding of things that we can see physically. Um, and that tend to impact our mobility rather than speech swallowing and voice where they are more subtle or quote unquote invisible. So we know Parkinson's impacts your dopamine and that dopaminergic system and how your sensory and, and motor systems work and voice swallowing and speech are all motor movements. So we know that there is going to be or could be an impact because they're all motor movements. Um, so as SLPs, we treat those voice swallowing, speech, cog cognitive changes due to Parkinson's. And today we'll be diving deeper into just the top three. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. With Parkinson's, we also know because of the nature of the more subtle speech, voice and swallowing symptoms, people tend to seek the support of an SLP after they've been experiencing these symptoms for a longer time, right? So they may not come up at that yearly or every six month check-in with your um, neurologist or movement disorder specialist. Um, and by the time most people seek treatment, direct intervention is required. So through intervention, what we really need to do is address the underlying problems or underlying challenges that are occurring. So generally as SLPs, how we truly target that is through the principles of neuroplasticity or how our our brain adapts and evolves to make change because um, we know we're experiencing these, these challenges, these symptoms, and we wanna make sure we're making changes um, and combating those directly. So there are numerous components of neuroplasticity, but for SLP treatment, there are more of those principles that we target more frequently. So repetition is one that we use very often. It's making sure we're doing maximum repetitions of a certain exercise or maximum repetitions in terms of um, your home exercise program. And then intensity, making sure the practice or things that we're working on is intense. So not only are they high repetition, but they're also more frequent. And also we want to overload that system to come and bring about change. So if your goal is here, we want to overtrain, overload so you can help meet the demands when you want to. Specificity is another one of those principles that we target. And that's because we want to make sure we are working on things exactly the way you're experiencing them in those exact challenges. So making their specifically whether it's a specific sentence or a specific food that you're having difficulty working on that exact challenge to make sure it, it, we are directly impacting it. Salience. We want to really ensure as SLPs that we are making the material functional. We're making it important to you. If it's not important to us or not important to our brain, we're less likely to make those changes um, to help address those symptoms. And then transference. So we love when things happen in session and they're great, they're awesome, but we wanna make sure we're transferring those skills to other environments. So whether that be at home, work, in the grocery store, when you're out to dinner, making sure those skills are transferring over and that can also help with carryover activities or home exercise programs. So a quick poll. From our audience today, who has experienced challenges with their voice, swallowing, speech, or all three? So just to take a quick moment. So a poll is going to pop up on your screen. Um, if you can select or participate if you'd like and then submit your answer, we will go over those results. Okay, all right, so our results are in, and it looks like um, it's almost pretty much evenly matched um, of our audience today. 
about 46% or almost half of the people today have experienced challenges with their voice. And 43% uh, also said that they're experiencing symptoms above all. And then a, a quarter or a third of our population or our audience today experiencing some swallowing or, or speech changes. I, uh, I appreciate you all kind of participating and letting me know a little bit more about you in this virtual setting. So we will keep on going. Okay. So our first topic is voice. This is a direct quote from one of my patients who I've been working and he told me when he first came in, my wife is constantly asking, asking me to repeat myself. I, I think she needs a hearing aid. So something that we know is with care partners, it, it is challenging and to always have to repeat yourself, it, it can be frustrating. Um, so we really wanna help work on these things and, and help address them. And it may not be that your wife needs a hearing aid. It may be a, a mismatch in perception due to Parkinson's. With voice, as we age, there are minor changes in the voice that we know can occur. So, this is called presbyphonia, so age-related changes um, in the voice. So what that may look like is a little bit of bowing of the vocal cords, and it can cause a little bit more hoarseness, but this would be more subclinical. So nothing that would truly, it shouldn't really impact your life um, all that much. So those are some minor age-related changes that we could see. With Parkinson's, we know there are changes that are common. So one of the greatest changes that we'll see is reduced loudness or that hypophonia. Um, hoarseness uh, because of re either reduced coordination or amplitude of movement of our vocal cords running out of breath when you are speaking, um, coordinating that respiratory and our, our phonation, a vocal tremor can also occur. And then another one of our, our, our big changes that we see are perceptual changes in vocal output. Um, so that tends to be the cause of why people say, oh, my wife keeps on asking me to repeat. It's that mismatch in perception of how loud our voice is being um, in compared to normal loudness. So these combination of voice factors that we know can occur in Parkinson's along with that masked expression that can also occur, it lends itself to frustration. It lends itself to communication breakdowns, not only with your care partner, maybe family, friends, it causes you to have difficulty being heard or, or understood. And then at times participating in work, social, family conversation and events, and it does potentially lead to social isolation. If communication is so frustrating or burdensome, people tend to shy away from it um, and become more socially socially isolated. So we want to help support you get that power, get that strength back, and to avoid all of these. So luckily, we have some wonderful, really research, evidence-based practices for Parkinson's that are some gold standards. And they they really help address a lot of these things through those principles of neuroplasticity. So one of those programs, and many of you have may heard of it or have participated in it, it's called LSVT Loud or Lee Silverman Voice Treatment. Um, it is truly an effective treatment for people with PD. So I am a, a certified loud clinician, like Melody had said. Um, so it was developed over 25 years ago by Dr. Ramig and her team, and it has a robust amount of research backing it, backing the, the treatment efficacies and the effects on not only voice, but the speech subsystems and 
and swallowing and in other subsystems as well. So what this LSVT loud treatment does is it aims to help kind of tune up or recalibrate the voice and speech subsystems and to help with that kind of mismatch in perception of voice output. So LSVT loud improves understanding of how to comfortably use a stronger voice at a normal loudness, right? So we are working on making sure that voice is strong, but within a, a, a normal loudness and a comfortably healthy level. So what this model looks like is it's an intensive one-on-one -on -one treatment and it consists of one hour sessions typically and it's a four by four model. So what that means is four sessions a week for four weeks in a row for 16 session totals. And it does work on the frequency, intensity, salience, transference, all of those things that we had talked about previously. And it includes daily homework, carryover exercises. And the goal is to really rev up that stronger voice. But the key part of LSBT Loud is having the guidance of a trained SLP to be a part of your team and to ensure crucial utilization of that, that healthy vocal loudness. So if we can go to the extreme and it could be vocally abusive. So having an SLP be a part of your team and a certified SLP and a trained SLP to help provide you those services. Because I know all of you can Google the LSVT Loud exercises and look them up on YouTube or Google and making sure you have an SLP in your corner there to support you is really what makes the difference in going through that program as, as it is structured and intended. So we also have another great program for voice that's called Speak Out and it's through the Parkinson's Voice Project and it also includes individual speech therapy sessions using those principles of neuroplasticity. Um, this program is a little bit different. So it is three sessions for four weeks for a total of 12 sessions. It also includes daily homework, exercise, education, but it also includes some speech, voice, and cognitive exercise as part of um, the program. One of the, the questions I get very often or frequently is, well, what's the difference between LSVT loud and, and speak out and which one's better or which one should I do? So I am not trained in the speak out program, but they both have their benefits and it is more about finding an SLP and coming together as a team to figure out which one is going to be best for you. So maybe that four by four model is, is too intense and you can't make it to all those. And, and the speak out may be a better option. Um, LSVT has over 25 years of research behind it where speak out is, is newer. So it was more in like 2010. So it's still has research, but LSVT does have more years and more studies done and completed. So it's working together with your SLP to kind of find out what program is going to be a, a better match, a better fit, and also access to care. I know because LSVT has been around for a longer period of time that there are more clinicians or more SLPs who are certified in LSVT Loud. So you may have better access to care by doing the LSVT Loud rather than the Speak Out to find certified clinicians, um, you can go to both of their websites respectively to find a clinician in your area and do a quick search based off of your location. But also, you can also work with your physician, your neurologist, your, your movement disorder specialist to figure out which program is gonna be best for you because they, they have also been working with you and, and know you best. So we're truly working with your team to kind of find out what's gonna be that, that best program. Moving on, respiratory muscle strength training is a, another research-based protocol that helps improve voice swallowing and cough functions. We will be talking more about those cough functions and swallowing later, but 
respiratory muscle strength training is another way to that targets those principles of plasticity. What it is is more of a, a five by five by five model. So the training duration typically is um, five weeks, five repetitions of each exercise, five times a day. So how this works is typically there's a, a device or a respiratory muscle strength training device. Um, it could be there's the breather or the EMST. So there are different devices that can be used to help. And what it does is it helps with that overload principle. So you generate excess force through continued airflow during exhalation. And really what it does is it helps strengthen those muscles, work on overloading. And the, the research behind it and behind EMST is it's shown to help improve the strengthening of the muscles and a voluntary cough function, which we really like that cough function to um, help keep our airways clear and protected. As part of voice therapy in, in my practice and other SLPs, we use visual feedback systems to help combat that mismatch in perception. Um, and to help boost understanding perceptually of kind of what's what's going on and, and what is that normal loudness, right? So as a, a visual feedback system, you can always use your care partner, right? If you, your spouse, your friend, whoever it may be, whether they're just telling you to speak up a little bit louder or give me a thumbs up that you're within that normal range and they can hear you. Um, care partners tend to wear a lot of hats. So we want to make sure that we're, we're transferring as much of that to um, other systems as well. So we use um, in session in therapy, we will use a sound decibel meter to measure where you are, whether it be during vocal exercises or speaking tasks or a reading task, where your vocal loudness is in terms of that normal range. And then pretty much everyone's got a smartphone nowadays. So loudness apps have become really, um, they're available. They're right there. They can be in your pocket and you can use that external perceptual system all the time. So you can have your phone out on the dinner table to give you that feedback if, if you're talking loud enough and you're out with friends and family, or if you're on the phone with a friend, you can have that kind of app open to gain that um, feedback without having to rely on anyone else. You can do that independently. So some loudness apps, if you just go in the app store and search Sound Decibel Meter Pro, that's one that I use because there's a, a free and a paid for version. There's um, just decibel meters out there. There's a variety of them working with your SLP to find the one that's going to be a best fit for you. Um, my favorite color is red too, so I, I like to use this one. And there's also apps through Speak Out and LSBT Global has an app to work on those exercises as well. So really helping you to become independent and using those external sources to help boost that perceptual understanding. With voice therapy, we are ramping up the demands that we place on your voice production. So we want to make sure that we are giving your voice the optimum environment to function. So kind of vocal hygiene is kind of like hand hygiene or personal hygiene, things that you do to keep you safe. So for example, um, a part of some people's vocal hygiene programs, it may be about increasing hydration. We want to keep those vocal cords happy and hydrated. It may include reducing exposure to irritants. So what I mean by that is smoking or a reduction in smoking or being around a, a bonfire or other irritants such as chemicals or propellants like a Lysol spray or anything that may irritate your vocal cords. Rest, vocal rest. We are asking a lot of that voice through voice therapy. We're ramping up, we're using that overload principle. So we wanna make sure we're also balancing out a good amount of rest. 
Avoiding throat clearing can be part of a vocal hygiene program if, some, if that is part of someone's kind of vocal habits. Throat clearing is just one of those aggressive um, slamming of the vocal cords. We want to make sure we're using a healthy voice. Avoiding whispering as well. Whispering is one of those things as it, it may be easy to do, but we want to make sure we're avoiding it because it actually is a little bit harmful to the voice. Reducing competing background noise is another part of vocal hygiene programs that can be really effective for individuals with Parkinson's. That's something that if we're having some difficulty with projecting that voice or using that normal loudness, we want to reduce any extras, right, that background noise. And then also if this person has a, a GI or reflux history that we're complying with our um, physician um, guidelines and making sure because if there are any reflux or if you had pasta that night, some red sauce coming up, we wanna make sure that it's not getting to the level of the vocal cords and we're keeping them happy and that we're in a good space. So again, if you have any questions regarding voice or some of the voice treatment options, please share in the chat. In regards to swallowing, he, a quote from a patient that I, I have received is, I cough every time I take a drink and my pills feel like they get stuck. So again, not an un common sentiment that I received during someone's initial evaluation. Sometimes it's just the first half. Sometimes they're just coughing or sometimes it's just the second half of sometimes pills are getting stuck or that combination of both. So these are some, some red flags to me if either one of those are occurring. With swallowing, there are some expected minor changes that can occur in swallow function. Again, they are classified as subclinical, so they really shouldn't be impacting your swallow function or your ability to maintain good hydration and nutrition with age. So what some of those minor age-related changes can occur is a, a slight delay in your swallow trigger or when your swallow is initiated, maybe delayed ever so slightly. There could be some degree of flash penetration so what that means is material getting just above the level of the vocal cords, but then getting cleared automatically. And then some degree of occasional coughing is normal, right? Everyone I'm sure on the call has probably taken a, a, a sip or a drink of something and it's gone down the wrong pipe. So occasional coughing is, is okay. It happens to everyone, but if we're seeing it become more consistent. It's at every mealtime, every drink, that's when it's that red flag where we should really seek um, some, some guidance. So why we see some swallowing changes in Parkinson's is because of rigidity in the swallowing muscles. Just like there's rigidity in your, your upper and your lower extremities, there can also be rigidity in the movements of your swallowing a reduction in amplitude, right? So sometimes with Parkinson's, we see people take those smaller steps or reduced amplitude in movement. We'll see that as well in the swallowing. A reduced coordination of the swallowing mechanism as a whole and reduced speed or timeliness is also seen. And then one of the, the biggest things that can also happen as well is some sensory changes so there will be a reduced swallow or cough reflex. So our body may not be analyzing that there is something on the level of vocal cords to cough it, to clear it, to get it to that esophagus. So that is what we may see in Parkinson's. So what these symptoms might look like, which are related to the sensory and motor changes in Parkinson's, is that significant coughing during mealtimes. We want to make sure if, if you're taking a sip and you're, you're coughing immediately all the time, every meal, I would definitely seek the, the support of your SLP. 
difficulty chewing or manipulating the food or liquids within your mouth and swallowing bigger pieces than you intended. The feeling of food or pills being stuck um, and some residue buildup as well can also be something that it may look like in Parkinson's. Food being left over in the mouth, right? So after we swallow, is there food still lingering in the mouth? Is there a need to kind of clear that, do a lingual sweep or a, a liquid wash? And then unexpected weight loss. So if you are seeing some of these symptoms, um, I would definitely reach out to your physician, your neurologist to make sure you are um, seeking some SLP support. So everyone is different in their swallowing needs. And uh, one of my favorite professors used to always tell us, if you've seen one person with Parkinson's, then you've seen one person with Parkinson's. So everyone is truly different in their needs. And therefore, an objective measure of swallow function and safety is necessary as part of your care. So it's great if you have your evaluation, or your, your diagnostic procedure with your SLP in office, but having more advanced um, objective measures of swallow is crucial to really target what specifically is happening. So um, the, the top two uh, listed over there are kind of the gold standard in terms of assessing swallow function. So the first one is called a modified barium swallow study. Some of you have or may have gone for one or, or heard of it before. It is a x-ray and it is a, a functional x-ray. So what happens is the person is eating or drinking a variety of food and liquid consistencies. And it is a, a video x-ray of what is happening or occurring during that swallow. And then you can also in real time, trial out some strategies that may be beneficial to help support safety. A fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallow or fees is uh, an, another one of those gold standard procedures to help measure swallow function and safety. And what it is, is it's a little camera and it's directly above um, those vocal cords. So you can see if there's material getting to the level of the vocal cords or potentially getting below the level um, and that swallow function um, within. And after those diagnostic procedures, um, some treatment options may include, and again, it, it's, it's everyone is different. It's kind of tailored to your specific needs, but it may include a tailored exercise program. So there are exercises and research-based exercises that we can do to help with swallow function. So one of those exercises is called an effortful swallow or hard swallow. That's one that we, we use a lot for our patients because the best practice for swallowing is more swallowing. So we can all kind of try it right now. So what it is, is just adding more effort to your swallow. So that effortful swallow. So you're really just squeezing all the way down from start of your swallow to finish, you are adding more resistance to your swallow um, to help train it. So that's just one of those exercises that could be a part of your exercise program. Compensatory swallow strategies to maximize safety, right? So during that MBS or fees, what are the things that we can do to help compensate for swallowing and how we can get there safely. So something that can be recommended, it is good for some people, not good for others, um, is called a, a chin tuck. And it does help with airway protection. So that is when you take a sip of whatever liquid or solid that you're having, you hold the food or drink in your mouth, you tuck your chin, and then you swallow. So that is just one of those compensatory swallow strategies. Works for some people, maybe not beneficial for others. So that's why those objective measures are crucial. 
we want to help support your optimum nutrition and hydration. So if swallowing is difficult, sometimes we see individuals who don't eat as much or don't drink as much because it is frustrating. It is challenging. So we want to make sure we're keeping you safe, but that you're getting enough hydration and nutrition to support your body as a whole and maximize independence when eating and drinking. So is there a is there a cup that can help support you? Or can I ask my, my OT colleague if there's a better spoon or fork or adaptive silverware to help you maintain more independence when you are eating and drinking? Oral hygiene protocols are also a big part of swallowing therapy. The more we can keep our oral cavity clean and reducing that bacteria content, the better. So even if something were to go down the wrong pipe or we were to aspirate that material, if we're having a great oral hygiene program, if we're brushing those teeth, we're making or just brushing the mouth, we're reducing that bacteria content if material does by any chance get into the lungs. And then education. Education is huge. There are so many things that we can help teach or guide or share to make sure you are getting to where you need to be to eating those foods and that you love and enjoy and drinking those drinks that you love and because the the last thing we really want is any diet modifications they're they're truly only if necessary um, so if we need them we can always do diet modifications but there are so many other things that we can help support you in so we, we have options underlying swallowing problems can result in we had talked about like some aspiration so below the level of our vocal cords so our vocal cords are our last line of defense before our lungs so if there's material getting Below there, there is the risk for aspiration pneumonia. And there also could be um, a decreased ability to maintain that adequate hydration and oral nutrition and hydration, which can lead to weight loss or dehydration. So we want to make sure we're maintaining a, a good, healthy weight and also having uh, enough nutrients and hydration within our body. So some really basic general swallowing strategies um, that we can use. Everyone is different and will have different needs, but today just to talk about a few that can help support swallow safety. So some of those strategies include taking one bite or one sip at a time. I know we've all been there and we <laughs> may be really thirsty. We do a look, 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 look. Just taking one bite or one sip at a time can help give our body that time to coordinate our muscle movements, to coordinate that swallow, to make sure the material is getting where it needs to go. Also taking a small bite or a small sip can help with that control. If we know there's a breakdown in that swallow function or strength, taking a small bite or a small sip can help you gain more control and help propel that food back where it needs to go. Alternating a bite, then a sip, then a bite, then a sip is another great way for people who are experiencing some of that residue or leftover in the mouth or even residue um, in the pharynx. So by taking a sip after you eat um, some solids to kind of wash everything down is a great way um, if you are experiencing those symptoms. Reducing our rate of intake as a whole. I know individuals have reported to me that sometimes it's difficult to keep food on, on a spoon or on a fork, maybe because of a tremor. So it's, it's challenging to keep that material there. So what they do is they just try to take it as fast as they can to their mouth and then go for that swallow. We wanna, and I, I know this is very challenging, there are things we can do to help the tremor during eating. So reducing our rate so our body again has that time to analyze, 
there's something there, let's prep, let's push that food or liquid where it needs to go and increase safety. Reducing distractions, I'm sure we're all guilty of maybe eating in front of the TV. The more you can allow all of your cognitive energy to go solely towards eating and drinking to support safety. Um, if our attention is divided to maybe a TV, the radio, your care partners in the room as well, that may, um, it, you may have more instances of where food may be going down the wrong pipe just because of that that cognitive energy is divided up on more tasks than just swallowing. So reducing distractions. And then um, a strategy that we use sometimes with people who have difficulty swallowing pills or saying that they, they get stuck, um, using a soft solid so or, or pureed solid, whether that be applesauce, yogurt, pudding, using that puree or that softer solid as a carrier substance to help so those pills don't get stuck and your body has a little bit more material to push where it needs to go. So again, the best practice for swallowing function is more swallowing, that specificity. So keep swallowing, keep swallowing your saliva. The more swallowing, the better. Moving on to another one of our topics today is speech. So this is another direct quote from one of my patients. Um, they told me my words get jumbled and blend together. With speech, there are not age-related changes that we, we expect to see so our articulation and, and speech production develops during childhood um, and throughout adolescence. So we have already developed our speech and sound production um, bef way before adulthood. So if there are any changes that are happening with the speech, I would definitely check with your neurologist um, or your primary care, but most often those changes will be due to Parkinson's. So what that may look like mispronounced or misarticulated sounds. We know there's reduced amplitude in all motor movements. Speech is a motor task. Your tongue, your lips, your jaw, they're all moving. If there's a reduction in amplitude or it's a little bit, it has a reduction in coordination, we may see some misarticulated or jumbled sounds. We will also see vowel changes and pitch changes. And pitch changes can be more to that perceptual mismatch. So the tone gets reduced. So a lot of people say, my spouse or my care partner thinks that I'm mad at them, but I, I, I'm really not. It's just, I have a hard time conveying that I'm happy or conveying that I'm excited. And that tends to be due to that reduction in pitch, the difficulty with the, the some mass facial expression. So it does lead to communication breakdowns. Sometimes we get rushed sounds. So they kind of get pushed together or jumbled, right? They kind of fall over one another. That's also common because of that, that reduction in coordination. So some speech therapy treatment options, and again, it's very broad, wide, it's, it's truly what you and your speech therapist come as a team. It should be person-centered. It should be about you as the individual with Parkinson's. Where are you experiencing your difficulties? Where are you experiencing those breakdowns? What exact sounds are causing those trip-ups? What is what's really causing the breakdown and targeting that directly. So what we use is functional material. What that means is we should be working on and practicing the things that you say every day. So if there's functional sentences or functional phrases that you say every day, let's practice them. So for me, it would be large black coffee, please. 
Or if I was trying to get my dog to come inside, I would say, nugget, let's go. So there are things that we say every day and we should be working on them. Or if there is, if you're an avid golfer and you talk about golf a lot, let's practice talking about golf. Let's have those conversations and practice what is important to you. There are a variety of speech strategies in and of themselves. So beyond the loud, there's also, you could go slow or clear or slow, loud and clear. Um, there are speech strategies. Some work for individuals, some don't. It's kind of trial and error and working with your SLP to find out what's going to be best for you. Script training is another way to help boost that practice. So what I mean by script training is if you go to Dunkin' Donuts or did go to Dunkin' Donuts every morning and you ordered your coffee, but have been shying away from it because you may not be as confident in your speech, let's work on that. If that is something that you love and enjoy, let's practice that. Let's, let's write a script together of I'll, I'll be the cashier and you can be the customer and working on ordering that coffee. So script training is a great way partner communication training. Communication is not a one-way street, right? It's that dance and conversation. So by working with your, your care partner, your care team to work on partner training, working on strategies that will work for both of you or working with your family because everyone is an individual. Pacing techniques. If those rushed um, incidences of speech are occurring, let's slow down that speech, right? Let's give your body that time to produce those sounds, get those articulators where they need to be. Um, so whether that may be a pacing board, right? So you're tapping different sounds or tapping your leg. There are different pacing techniques that we can use speech amplifiers, right? So sometimes we just need to boost that volume to help our listener understand. Um, so there are a variety of speech amplifiers that you can use. Like we tell people to go on Amazon sometimes, you can find them for like 10 to $15. Also alternative or augmentative communication devices can also be used. And that can be a variety of uh, a low tech option. So, right, is it just a, a paper based thing where maybe you're pointing to help support your listener or, or is it a high tech option, right? So Lingraphica is a, an option or a company that we use with a high tech device where we can program it to say whatever you need to say to help you communicate your message. So here are some basic communication tips um, that can be used in, in your everyday if you're experiencing these. So making sure you are in the same room as your communication partner, setting yourself up for success. If your communication partner is in a totally different room, I know I'm guilty of it. I just did this with my fiance over the weekend, yelling for a glass of water, he didn't hear me led to a communication breakdown. So if you secure your, apart, your partner's attention before delivering your message, that can help support your success. So whether you're going into the room to communicate that message, or if you are calling for your partner to have them come in the same room as you, again, securing their attention first. Checking in with your listener, asking them, can you hear me? Or did you hear me? Or did you understand me? What you say has value and meaning and is important. So checking in within your listener is okay. Be, being clear in our message. Um, as a speech therapist, I'm sometimes wordy, right? So tailoring down what we're saying to make sure if we know we're, we're running out of air with longer sentences, short, shortening them for the time being to help your message be carried on. Pacing words or syllables, right? If you're having those rushed instances where it's getting jumbled, slowing down those words, slowing down those syllables so you have time and you're giving your body time to produce those syllables. Rephrasing your message. 
if you're you're trying 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 to communicate something and it's just not working it's okay to rephrase what you're saying and to see if that can help click with your listener using gestures to help support or supplement your words it's okay if if there's a breakdown in communication and you use gestures to say oh i, I need a drink right using gestures to help support you it's okay to support yourself and then making sure you have good lighting. With COVID, I know it's very challenging because we lose with masks, we lose a lot of visual information. So not just only good lighting, making sure you have good visual information for your listener and vice versa, so you can help support your message. Practice, practice, practice. Stay socially engaged as much as you can. I, I know right now it, it is challenging because of COVID, but the more interactions, the better. Your speech production is within your power, right? You have the opportunities through, whether it be face-to-face -face interactions with the people within your bubble or everyday outings, right? If you go to the market and you can say, hey, how are you? that is an opportunity to practice your speech. Um, today, I know we're not able to see one another, but um, if we were to be in person, we could have that opportunity to practice. Um, Zoom, FaceTime are great ways to boost your opportunities because every interaction is a communication opportunity. So I don't want you to just take my word for it. Um, I, I say this is a, a really <laughs> cheesy picture of me and some of my SLP colleagues at our East Greenwich Clinic. Um, so I had the opportunity to kind of have an informal interview with one of the individuals who I've been working on and off with, with this SLP team for about two years now. And he provided me with his perspective on speech therapy and the things that he's been working on. So he's allowed me the opportunity to gather his perspective and share it with you today. So this individual is an 81 year old male who initiated SLP services in April of 2019 and then reinitiated services in June of 2022, uh, 2020 for voice swallowing and cognition. And this is secondary to Parkinson's, which he was diagnosed with about three years ago. So I asked him, what do SLPs do? And he comedically responded to me, turns out I thought that speech therapy wasn't all that important. In the context of Parkinson's, it has changed my life because I've been studying these three with you. I'm in this realm where I have lost time for two years trying to understand Parkinson's, but in the end, I should have come here sooner. I had asked him, why do you get speech? And he told me, I wanted to fix that. I fixed that by taking your swallowing program. I fixed that by taking your loud program with you. And now I'm taking this cognitive program. The thing about Parkinson's is that most people turn away from it. At 80 years old, you can't turn away from anything that is going to make you feel good. That's why I ended up here. I had asked him, what has been the greatest impact? He expressed to me, it changes the way I interact with people, my family for the better. Beyond the things we have worked on, I've noticed a change in my mood because I can do things about the things that bother me. This has repaired me emotionally without directly working on it. Turns out that's as important as it gets. And I asked him, who brought it up to you? And he told me, I've been working with my movement disorder specialist and he suggested it to me based on my concerns. I now know what I need to work on. Before I felt shameful to hide these changes I was experiencing, now I hit them head on. Some days I still don't believe it. From the swallowing, I now know what exercises and tricks to do to help. The voice, I now have the power and volume. I got this under control. And I asked him, 
what would you say to someone who didn't want therapy? <laughs> and he told me, I did not want to come to therapy at all during this process. I have improved. The guy I started here with is not me. I was embarrassed. Now it's not true. I took advantage of SLP programs and it's like magic. I feel good about myself now. And I asked him, what would you tell others? And he responded, I won't give you a manufactured response. Parkinson's is a nasty disease that attacks the motor systems and behavior. It wants to overcome you. SLPs gave me the tools to fight that feeling. I gained the control and the things that I haven't, I've kept them steady. So I asked, would you recommend SLP services to people with Parkinson's? And he said, absolutely. However, the progress you make here in speech requires discipline. The first year I thought the homework was silly, but gradually it caught on to me. Once I started doing these things at home, it helped me heal. And then the last question I asked him was, is there anything you want to add? And he told me, it works. You're hurting yourself by not taking advantage. I found out the hard way. Now I can make progress and hold on to my voice swallowing and speech. I can get these things off the internet, but coming to therapy is what helped me most. So again, I am truly grateful that he was able to provide his insight and perspective, um, just so you didn't have just my perspective on it, but a, a patient who I've been working with. So I included just some really quick brief resources from um, our ASHA website. If you need or want more information about speech language pathology or the Parkinson's Foundation um, link, or LSVT Global if you're looking for a clinician or the Parkinson's Voice Project. So some really quick resources. And I, I truly thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I am grateful to have had this opportunity to be here and to talk with you. If any of you in the audience have any questions or any feedback or just wanna say hi, this is my contact information. Um, so my email, my phone, my fax. If you have any questions, again, you can reach out to me. Um, and speaking of, I will give it back to Melody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sheena, for sharing this fantastic information um, and your really insightful presentation. I especially um, loved your patient's experience. I think that was an added bonus for us all. And please do extend our gratitude to him. So we did receive some really excellent questions from our web audience. So we'll take a few extra minutes of your time to cover these. Yes. Uh, for anyone who's still with us, we'll probably take about 10 minutes for these. Again, we have some excellent questions here. So if you're willing to stay on folks, I think your peers will um, provide you with some really wonderful added information. So let's see, Gina, our first question is, uh, my loved one with Parkinson's is unaware when they are drooling. Any suggestions for um, comfortably letting them acknowledge that they're drooling? Yeah, of course. So uh, again, we know with Parkinson's, there's that perceptual piece um, or that, that sensory component where the person may not notice or analyze or sense that they're having a buildup of saliva which can lead to drooling. There are also some postural components to that as well. So we know sometimes with Parkinson's, um, individuals may have a more stooped posture, which lends itself for material to, if there is a buildup to come forward. So one, you can always check in with them on where is their posture? Are they sitting? Are they sitting upright in the chair? That kind of gives that body a, a more neutral position for swallowing and then it's okay to cue them like hey do you have to swallow um it, it's okay they they most likely are not aware or they may be aware and just can't sense it um that there's something there there's also um different apps or even if the person has like an apple watch that you can set different vibrations for a cue to swallow, whether it be every five minutes cueing to swallow, it vibrates. Can other be a, a good external cue beyond um, you as the care partner reminding them to swallow? 
Awesome. Thanks, Gina. We've got quite a few questions on that swallowing piece and, and drooling and overnight and during the day. So that's really helpful um, information. So a question from our audience. Um, how do I find a speech therapist near me? Oh, great question. Um, so I would first go to whoever you've been working with, whether that be your neurologist, your movement disorder specialist, your PCP, they will most likely have a, a list of or know of facilities in the area that can help support you. But if there's a, a tailored program or something specifically, most of the like LSVT Loud, they have registries where you can put in your like your zip code and give a, a radius of the, the distance you're willing to travel to provide you with the clinicians within your area that are in there. Um, so that's, I would definitely start with your physician to see who they work with. Awesome, thank you. And you mentioned this a little bit, you know, the sooner the better to start, but at what point in the symptom progression would you recommend pursuing LSBT loud, uh, specifically if you only have hypophonia and do you repeat it periodically or is it a one shot deal? Oh, wow, the audience has some great questions. Um, yeah, yes, yes, and yes. So uh, LSBT loud, the research shows the sooner the better. So if you are noticing any changes in that voice, come for therapy. And yes, we encourage tune-up sessions all the time. Um, you are the expert in you and your care partner is the expert in you as well. So if you're noticing any reduction or lack of maintenance of the skill or that powerful voice, um, you can always come up for tune-up sessions. But we also have loud for life or group loud sessions that are um, throughout the community um, that can be part of that more maintenance of the loud skills. And I, I know with COVID too, a lot of individuals are, are not coming to in-person sessions. So LSBT loud does have the e-loud where you can receive um, those services right in the comfort of your home, keeping you safe, but also making sure you are getting the care and making sure we're tuning up that voice. Awesome, you answered our next question. Somebody asked if um, LSBT and Speak Out were available virtually right now in these peculiar times we're in. So it sounds like they are? Yes, yeah. Okay, awesome. Any thoughts on singing to support healthy voice production? Um, we also, it's sort of a two-part question. Does that help? And also there are singers in our audience who get this sort of choking feeling. Um, I want to look at Adam's apple. Any, anything to overcome that during singing? So um, with, singing is a great way. Um, again, those large amplitude, increased volume, we love singing. There are specific programs or groups just for singing with Parkinson's. Um, we, we have one here in Rhode Island called Ah Tempo. Um, so keep on singing, singing in the shower, in the car. If that is something you are passionate about and you do often, crank up that volume, singing is wonderful. In terms of feeling of any pressure or choking with singing, I would check in um, with your local ENT to see if we can get a visualization of those vocal cords, especially if singing is something you're passionate about, just to make sure where we can get a picture of, is there any increased tension, tightness? Do we have any um, other things that are happening? Because that feeling of choking when singing is, is not the most common. So I would definitely, um, find an ENT um, who works with people with Parkinson's and, or singers specifically. Awesome, thanks Gina. And again, folks, these are such fantastic questions. If you're able to stay on, I think there's plenty of learning to do here. I'm learning a lot. Um, this is a great question. Can you talk about Gina, the complications of hearing problems and you, using hearing aids and effective level of speech production and the interaction with these? Yeah. Really great questions, Melody. Um, so we, <laughs> we know with individuals who may have a hearing loss, depending if it's like a high frequency, low fre frequency, mixed sensory neuro, there's a the whole variety. Um, typically with individuals with hearing loss, they tend to speak louder naturally because 
part of their auditory loop, they're not hearing themselves as loud. So they tend to speak louder. Now with that amplification or, or with a hearing aid, that kind of should hopefully level out that hearing loss to within normal. So with Parkinson's and hearing loss, we want to make sure we're kind of recalibrating um, what that normal level is so that that appropriate decibel level and kind of working with that, that person, that individual to have those external supports that we had talked about because it, it is challenging, right? We, we have the hearing loss, we have the amplification system. There, there's a lot going on to coordinate. So working as a team to kind of find out what cues, what external strategies are going to, to help that person, but that, that's a great question. It, it can be challenging, but there are, there are things that we can do to kind of help match and support that person. Awesome. And we'll take just two quick more questions. I'm trying to condense them here for us. Um, what about stuttering? Is that something that you see a lot with your Parkinson's patients? And, and what are some tips for getting through that? Yeah, so we we classify stuttering as a like a, a disfluency. So typically when we speak, we would say speech is fluent. It has a flow to it anything that kind of breaks up or if there's that kind of stutter step in production of speech that's probably related to um, that coordination of that motor function of speech. So if someone is experiencing a, a, a quote unquote stutter due to Parkinson's that, that can occur, um, sometimes with DBS as well um, after that deep brain stimulation that's something because we're trying to kind of recalibrate everything. Um, and sometimes that's that's one of the impacts is on speech. So working to help get that flow, get that pacing down is can be impacted and helped. Awesome, thanks, Gina. One last question um, for anyone who has not been in touch with their SLP yet. Is there any at home exercises that are safe enough for them to try now? in the meantime, and what, what might those be? Did the person have a, was it voice swallowing speech? Did they? <laughs> we kind of had a mix. It seems like we have one okay. person who is talking and as they're talking, they just simply run out of air. Um, okay. We have a, a swallowing issue starting to cough during discussion. Okay. Fair. So um, in terms of the swallowing, right, I would definitely use that hard swallow as one of those exercises. It's really just squeezing the all the way down, adding that resistance. The more swallowing, the better. Keep swallowing. But while you're swallowing or doing those hard swallows, not having any liquid or material, keeping yourself safe while you're practicing that swallow. And then um, in terms of voice, there is what we just call a sustained ah, which sometimes works over a Zoom platform, sometimes it cuts out, but to help build that capacity, build that stamina, it's just a nice, easy ah, and that can really help work on all of those speech subsystems. Um, so one of those vocally intensive exercise to work on all that. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gina. I think this is all the time we have for this Q&A segment, which does conclude our presentation. And on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, Gina, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. This was absolutely fantastic and insightful. Um, and also, of course, the Spalding Outpatient Rehabilitation Center at Kent Hospital for their collaboration in delivering this program. And of course, to all of you, a very special thank you for joining us and sticking with us a little bit longer. Um, you had some really excellent questions that we really wanted to make sure that we got to. And if your question was not answered, please do feel free to call our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO. Our slides will be shared and Gina did share her contact information on there. So <laughs> Gina, you might be getting some emails, um, but you can also visit our website, parkinson.org or for a more local touch, visit us at parkinson.org slash New England. As I mentioned, this program was recorded and will soon be archived on our YouTube channel at parkinson.org slash YouTube. And another round of applause and thank you to today's sponsors who made it possible, Kiowa Kieran and Medtronic. 
You can learn more about our sponsors by visiting parkinson.org slash New England slash chapter supporters. And last but not least, we'll hope you come back soon. Um, talk about perfect timing. Next up in PD Health at Home on Wednesday, March 10th, we'll actually be using our best voices to sing out loud with Parkinson's led by another speech language pathologist. Uh, no musical experience is necessary to join us in warming up your voice and rehearsing a few musical tunes together. For a complete lineup of our PD Health at Home programs, visit parkinson.org slash PD Health. And our next New England Community Education Program is Exercise in Parkinson's on March 23rd with Dr. Mary Feldman at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and our research advocate, John Tominey. To learn more or to register for this program, please visit parkinson.org slash exercise NH. And I believe that just about wraps us up, folks. So in the coming days, you'll receive a short survey Please feel free to take a look at that when you can uh, complete it. We'd love to know your feedback, any other topics you'd like to learn about. Uh, Gina joined us today because this was a special interest topic to our, our friends and families and folks in Rhode Island. Um, so please do complete that survey. And on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you all. And thank you, Gina. Hope everybody has a, a nice day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.